So I've been tasked today to talk to you about um, clinics post-COVID because it's a, it's a big area at the moment with everything that's happened in the last few months. So just to give a background of exactly what happened. So the first case of coronavirus was confirmed in Ireland on February the 29th. After that, Ireland went into lockdown on March 12th. And with that, all face-to-face -face clinics and hospitals were cancelled. So this had a major impact on all our patients attending the ILD clinic. All radiology, so CT thoraxes, chest x-rays were cancelled. All pulmonary function tests were cancelled, phlebotomy, and any tests regarding lung biopsy. The majority of the private hospitals were taken over by the government for a three-month period. There was a tiny bit of benefit to that and um, because some of the transplant assessments were able to be done um, in the matter private under the purchasing treatment fund. So there was a clearance of some of the backlog. So what we did, we tried to respond um, and moved on to telephone um, and doing our clinics via the telephone. But this is actually difficult. And as IPF patients know, it's very hard to talk on the phone for a prolonged period of time because you get very breathless. And it's usually a one-way conversation because we don't get to hear from families or carers. Um, and some patients may tell the doctors or nurses what they want to hear. And it's very difficult for us to review patients because what we do when you come into hospital, come into clinic, when we call you into the room, we're assessing you walking in from the room, looking at how breathless you get, looking at the color of your lips, the color of your fingernails, being able to listen to your chest. So we do a lot of assessment with our eyes and also looking at the nonverbal cues from you, from the patient, their family and carers. And also it's an opportunity for, to ask questions because, you know, Usually with a phone call, you get an opportunity, any questions, no phone is hung up. So at least if it's in face to face, you do have a bit more time to think of the questions that you wanted to ask. Telephone clinics will have a place in our clinics in the future. So I will talk about that in further detail later on. So as to let you know, during lockdown, things still, still did happen behind the scenes. So as Dr. Judge talked about um, the radiology meeting with the, where we discussed scans um, with the rate consultant radiologists who have been interested in ILD and all respiratory consultants. So this still happened. ILFA responded brilliantly to the challenge and moved online um, and four groups um, got to meet together. And um, so that was quite interesting. And Neve and Paula down in Limerick did online home rehab, which was brilliant. And then Michael Dar McCauley um, helped with yoga sessions, which was very good. Again, for anxiety levels, there's a lot of anxiety and breathlessness around the whole coronavirus. We did have phlebotomy was called, but we were able in the Matter Hospital where I work. We did have certain um, phlebotomies and um, options for patients who are on oral antifibrotic therapy, as Dr. Judge mentioned earlier, for phenidone and metedinib. If you're established on treatment, you have to get your blood monitored every three months, and we were able to continue to do that during the lockdown. So we've moved into phase three, as our previous TTOC, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Radkert, uh, who's not a doctor anymore, um, talked about. So what we are aware of we have long waiting lists and this is a big thing for us at the moment and also a lot of new referrals and all patients who are due to see new patients who are due to us during the lockdown could not avail of the telephone clinics as dr judge mentioned we need to assess them listen to the chest get a detailed history and we could not do that over the phone so clinics are slowly recommencing so there's a lot, a lot of planning involved. I'll go through that now sooner. Um, a lot of Perspex has been installed in clinics. Um, a change to hand gels, including moisturizer, because we're washing our hands so much, and it's to minimize uh, dermatitis. Um, a lot of stickers being put up in clinic rooms. Um, 
you know, stand here. A lot of X's marks the spot. A lot of chairs being removed from clinic waiting rooms. So again, for patients, you know, you do need to sit down, rest, and there's not that many chairs as there was before. Face masks are going to be mandatory in clinic space where we can't maintain two meters social distance. Um, windows are going to be open, so it's going to be a bit cooler in clinics. Um, and hand hygiene is so important coming into the hospital. Um, washing the hands as per the World Health Organization guidelines, you do not need to wear gloves. Gloves are just a vector, just like your hands. So it's proper hand hygiene to use all um, alcohol gel where it's available. And coming into the hospital, it's always important to bring your clinic letters as well, because there is security on all doors. And if you don't have your clinic letters, they will not let you into the hospital. So in the last few weeks, um, with the phrase three, we have increased our clinic capacity to 25% face to face. We have concern because in the matter hospital, our inpatient outpatients are in the same building, so we want to minimize as much risk as we can. So when you're getting a clinic appointment, you're going to get a letter sort of in around two weeks before your clinic. And with that, you're going to get a questionnaire. And this is very important that you read this questionnaire. And there's five questions on it. And basically, it's an asking to maintain social distancing for two weeks prior to your clinic appointment. Um, any new symptoms to be recorded. So we are aware that patients who've got IPF or ILD are breathless and do have a cough. But we wanted to document if there's any change to your current status, if that breathlessness is worsened or if that cough is worsened. Patients will get a reminder phone call 48 hours before their appointment time. And again, the same questions will be asked by um, Mairead for us in our secretary, and these will be documented as well. And we want people to be as honest as you can because we will have to reschedule appointments, and that's no problem. We will reschedule as soon as we did have a lady come to a different clinic this week who answered all oh, no to these questions. And when we saw her in person, she actually was on treatment for respiratory tract infection. So she's putting us at risk and all other patients in the waiting room at risk. So if you have any symptoms that are new, please let us know and we will reschedule your appointment. As I said, telephone clinics will have will be continued and with that we'll have 75% telephone um, consultation. So more planning and this is the big thing. So we're slowly going to be able to increase um, over the next few weeks more to have more face-to-face -face, um, patients come into clinic. This again is linked to any more COVID cases as well. So if there's an increase of spike, this will drop. Um, it's important of everyone to get reviewed, be it new patients or review patients. Everyone is entitled to be reviewed in person. Our waiting room is shared with bronchoscopy, with the pulmonary function lab. And um, so we are conscious that our appointments are not going to clash with those appoint their appointments so there's not as many people waiting in the waiting room. Cleaning has increased as well. So we have to clean down all our clinic spaces and surfaces after a patient and their family leaves. Noon and cleaning are more visible and are cleaning the waiting rooms more often and the clinic spaces as well. A lot of planning as well. So we're meeting um, to discuss who can come in face to face and who's going to be telephone clinics. And we need to do this six weeks in advance. And this is where we have to have the two letter, two weeks for the letter to be sent out and the rolling 48 hour phone call. So there is a lot of planning going on behind the scenes. And we're doing a combination of telephone clinics. So we're looking at who got a telephone clinic the last time and we're going to try and see them face to face. So to to alternate so everyone gets to into the clinic where possible. So the nurse-led clinics, these are very important as well. Um, and again, our capacity is restricted because these run in parallel um, with our consultants clinic. So prior to COVID, we used to alternate with the consultants every four months into the consultant or to the nurse. So you're seeing sort of in and around three, four times a year, usually between the nurse and the consultant. Um, and we're going to continue that rotation as well. 
So that might push out your review with the consultants, which are still going to be linked in via the nurse clinic. And any concerns we have, we do talk with Dr. O'Reilly. Um, again, telephone clinics are good because um, for any patients the geographical location who have to travel with oxygen requirements, you know, these will have um, a point in the future. We have recommenced our oxygen clinics. Again, the capacity is still reduced. Um, and this is a big area for our patients at the moment. And the oxygen companies, BOC and Air Liquide, have been very good during the pandemic. They have been delivering oxygen quicker. And the engineer usually drops it to the door, goes back to the van and talks to people through it. And we've already provided some education over the phone as well. And oxygen clinics are important because we need to assess people face to face because we want to know whether you're a mouth breather or a nose breather because that has implications for what type of oxygen we will provide. So with capacity increasing, we're able to um, bring patients back for tests. Pulmonary function tests are restricted. They are seen as an aerolizing generating procedure. So again, this is where um, we're concerned regarding the transfer of COVID. So these are restricted. And we're trying to get people who are coming into the clinic face to face on the day to have their PFTs on the same day. And um, some maneuvers can't be done because of COVID. So yes, the most important one for us is spirometry to look at your FCC and DLCO, and these can be completed. They're restricted in capacity as well because they have they have to wait 30 minutes between each clinic appointment to let the air settle in the room. Phlebotomy is open um, and what we're trying to do is schedule appointments for phlebotomy for the same day as your clinic. So therefore trying to minimize your time in and out of the hospital so it's everything done in one day. Um, radiology is again slowly recommencing so we're trying to do chest x-rays because we like our patients to have a yearly chest x-ray um, and any CTs that need to be done for new patients. What we're doing regarding telephone uh, consultations, if you need a chest x-ray and bloods, we try and book them in advance. So you can come into hospital, get them done in the space of a half an hour, go home. We'll have those results for when we have a telephone clinic for you. So again, it's all about the planning that we're doing. So future developments, um, so there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that people don't get to see. So we're doing COVID screening uh, for procedures. So like Dr. Judge was saying, if you need further investigations like a lung biopsy, or in some cases people need bronchoscopies, um, we will be doing COVID screening where you get COVID swab. We will wait the results of that and then you'll be coming in for your test. We'll be using the patient Empower app more and some patients have been using this in the past where during the support group in Dublin, they trialed the spirometer and we did have um, a research trial in the matter using the patient Empower app where you'd be monitoring your spirometry at home. And I know during COVID, they did provide some digital monitors and some SAS probes where you can record information to your phone and the digital platform. And currently we can't access the portal for this information and we have to look in, into this in the future for us. T-Pro video conferencing is something that's going to be new coming to matter. And um, this is where you'd be like going to the GP, uh, coming into clinic, you'd be checking in on your phone, you'd be sitting in a waiting room and then we'll call you into the room so we can visibly see you on the computer and talk to you um, and your family. We'll be able to assess visibly and um, you know color of the skin sadly we won't be able to listen to any chest with that but we'll also be able to pull up any um, test results at the same time and any letters and there's the option to transfer your call to another room to meet other members of the team as well and um, we'll be doing virtual ILD rehab so that has been ongoing via ILFA with Neve and Paul in Limerick but we're going to be starting our ILD rehab again in the Matter Hospital. And um, we used to do three um, 10 week courses throughout the year in the Matter and um, for the last two years. We are now doing assessments one to one. And then um, our physios, Gronia and Gronia, 
we'll be doing um, virtual rehab online because uh, we can't have people mixing together. Um, also, we are we used to have the facility of walk tests at our clinic. So they're going to be starting again now in the next few weeks as well. It's all about planning to get our times and slots. So this will be happening hopefully August time. We will have our six minute walk test again at clinic. Um, also, we will hopefully be recommencing the ILD palliative care multidisciplinary teams meetings. Um, we had this with the, um, our consultant in St. Francis Hospital in Blanchetown, Professor Ryan and Yvonne, the lead nurse in community palliative care and Debbie from the Exhale program, used to meet with Dr. O'Reilly and ourselves, the nurses, um, every three months to discuss patients. So hopefully this will be recommencing as well in the next few weeks. And thank you for listening. Um, I know it was a quick run through. I thought this slide looked very much like a cat's head, looked like a pair of lungs and thought it was a bit funny at the end of this conversation. So any questions and thank you for listening. Um, just if I may ask, how soon after a diagnosis should you see the transplant team? It all depends really. Um, how well you are or how unwell you are because transplant basically is a fine tightrope and as Dr. Judd said it's only a certain criteria a certain uh, patient cohort is suitable so what we'd be looking is if there's any change in your um, force vital capacity as in a drop of 10% or your, if your DLCO is less than 40% on a first review with you you would be referral would be sent to the transplant it's important that patients um, are non-smoking for over a year. That is very important. Um, that they're active and that their body mass index is less than 28. Because they're all contraindications to a transplant. So it's important for patients to be aware of those things before, trans before referral. Thank you. And just one more. Is there any special consideration for this group in light of the COVID pandemic? Sadly not, um, and I think, you know, I have ILD and IPF in my heart, and I think there should be, and I think it's very important that we need to highlight the um, to the government and to our new Minister for Health the importance of developing an ILD clinical care programme for our patients so we can make um, everyone more aware of the special um, risk that COVID uh, poses to our patient cohort. Well, thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. If I may move along now, our third speaker. Uh, we're delighted that Danny will share a summary of the survey results with you today. So, Danny, if I can hand over to you. Okay, so just um, by way of background uh, to, to the survey results themselves, and today I'm just going to give a very um, high-level overview of some of the highlights of, of the survey results. Um, we had two strands on the research, uh, the stakeholder research, the infant stakeholder research. The first strand was um, a survey of infant stakeholders, uh, and this ran between April 16th and May, 20, uh, and May 5th of this year. So moving on, uh, it was online, uh, primarily online. Um, we also had a dedicated phone line to uh, accept responses for people who maybe, um, you know, weren't were fully comfortable re replying online or, or perhaps didn't have, have appropriate access at, at the time. So uh, most of those responses came online um, and some via de a dedicated survey phone line. Uh, for the stakeholder survey, uh, we had a total of 219 responses. Um, this broke out uh, into 111 uh, lung fibrosis patients, 59 caregivers to lung fibrosis patients, and 49 healthcare professionals who are working with uh, lung fibrosis patients. So um, a, a good number of responses, and uh, that allowed us to do uh, um, you know, a, a, a very robust analysis and uh, comparison between the stakeholder groups as well. Um, 
we supplemented uh, the survey with a second strand of research, which uh, was more qualitative in nature. Um, and this consisted of in-depth telephone interviews. Um, uh, these ran between the 28th of April um, and the 20th of May uh, this, this year. Um, and from the survey, uh, the, the online and, and telephone survey, we asked people to opt in if they wanted to participate in, in the, the, these deeper telephone interviews. Um, and we interviewed seven um, lung fibrosis patients, seven caregivers to lung fibrosis patients, and nine healthcare professionals. Now, um, like I say, these were in-depth telephone interviews. They, they were lasting, lasted maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and it allowed us to really get behind and, and understand uh, get a deeper understanding of the results that we saw from the survey itself. Uh, the healthcare professionals uh, consisted of um, uh, uh, nurses, consultants, um, and allied healthcare professionals as well. So the, um, just, just pulling out some, some of the uh, highlight results here, um, one of the questions we asked was to establish people's level of worry about the coronavirus uh, among the stakeholders. Now, the question we asked was, on a scale of one to 10, how worried are you personally about the coronavirus? Uh, one being not at all worried and 10 being extremely worried. Um, this question replicates a question that's asked on the Department of Health, um, a national survey that's happening on a weekly basis. Um, it's been happening on a weekly basis since the beginning of the, the, the COVID outbreak. Um, so we replicated that question. Um, Nationally, at the time of the uh, of of our research, um, the, the the national figure was a, a level of worry of six point six out of ten, um, and that was as I said during the period of of our research. That's based on a sample size nationally of about two thousand people, so it's a very very robust figure. It's being tracked um, on a weekly basis, as I say. It peaked. That figure peaked uh, on the March twenty third. Uh, so probably at the beginning of the lockdown period, uh, and it peaked at 7.3 out of 10 uh, for the national kind of general public population. The lowest it, it got was uh, 5.2 in early June, and it's back up to six nationally now, so it's actually rising again in the last few weeks. Um, and that, that's the national picture. Among the uh, ILFA stakeholder groups, so um, among lung fibrosis patients, we saw a level of worry of 7.4 out of 10. Um, and the biggest driver behind that was clearly, you know, uh, contracting the coronavirus itself. Uh, you know, it's a very vulnerable group. And uh, certainly that was driving that level of worry uh, among lung fibrosis patients. Um, and then next we looked at uh, caregivers to lung fi fibrosis patients. And the level of worry and anxiety among caregivers was higher still. Um, 8.1 out of 10, which is extremely high. Um, and that, in fact, was driven by uh, anxiety and worry uh, about the person that they were caring for contracting the coronavirus. Um, uh, uh, so so the, the health of family and friends was more important to caregivers than, than their own personal health and uh, their, um, their fear of contracting the virus themselves. Among healthcare professionals, then um, the, the average level of worry was six point five out of ten. Uh, so this is kind of in line with the national average. And again, this, this these were our survey results. Uh, the in-depth telephone interviews kind of informed or gave us a little bit more understanding of what was behind that. On the telephone interviews, we did see that caregivers, you know, are certainly are under um, a, a lot of stress. Um, they are. Uh, uh, during lockdown, they were dealing a lot of time with, you know, homeschooling uh, pressures, uh, working from home pressures on top of the, their existing uh, commi commitments to the people they were caring for. Uh, for, for, for the patients, um, a, a lot of the patients were telling us that, uh, you know, they're used to being careful about uh, their health and about their exposure to, to, to risky situations. So um, they were uh, sort of mentally more maybe 
more prepared for lockdown than, than, than a lot of other uh, sectors of society. Um, healthcare professionals, like they were explaining that you know it's that's their job um, and they're uh, familiar with and trained in infection control. Um, so and they were getting on as professionals with with their work. So again, th th that's all reflected in these figures. But the the interviews helped us kind of understand more what's going on behind behind those figures. So one of the sections on the survey was um, around exercise. And we asked people uh, uh, how often they exercise, uh, sorry, just patients. We, we just asked patients these questions um, about level of exercise. 49% of patients uh, indicated that they exercise daily. Um, now, th we, we did see within the, the, the patients that were responding to this, we did see some variation in that by, uh, by gender. Um, 20% of female patients actually indicated that they never exercised, uh, and only one of the male respondents indicated that they only that that, that they never exercised. So there was a significant uh, variance there in uh, exercise habits um, when we looked at it by by gender. We also asked people um, if they were exercising more, less, or less now, um, or about the same as. Uh, pre uh, pre COVID, uh, fourteen percent said they were exercising more. Thirty nine percent exercising about the same, and forty seven percent exercising less, um, which is is quite a high number. Um, I know comparing, we, we've asked this question on other surveys uh, that are more applicable, to, more more aimed towards the general general population, and that exercising less is a lot lower among the general population. So. Again, that's the effect of cocooning um, on, on the patient cohort here. Uh, it's having a significant, had a significant impact on the level of exercise. And then when we broke that down by um, region of the country, um, as we saw a significant difference, uh, whereby Dublin-based respondents uh, were the most likely group to be exercising less. 65% of Dublin-based respondents indicated that they were exercising less uh during the the lockdown period I, I'm sorry at the time of the survey but which was during the lockdown period um on, on that section on exercise we also asked um a question on, on any aids people use for um to, to, to help them with their exercise 49 percent of respondents use a, a pedometer um now that's not exactly the same 49% as the 49% who are exercising daily, but there is a very strong correlation between frequency of exercise and use of a pedometer. So in fact, 76% of those who exercise daily uh, use a pedometer. Um, so we can see there's a very high correlation there. Um, and, you know, certainly we, when we know that anything uh, in life, anything that gets measured gets managed. So uh, using a pedometer certainly would appear, you know, based on these results to, uh, to encourage more, more regular exercise. So it's a simple, a simple little uh, tool that can, that can be effective in, in promoting exercise. We had a section on the survey looking at quality of uh, nighttime sleep during the, the, the lockdown uh, period. Um, again, this is a question we have some external benchmarks for, so we can see um, for the different stakeholder groups, what the impact is on, on quality of sleep. Um, so uh, looking at patients, um, uh, among patients, 24% of patients indicated that their nighttime sleep had gotten worse during the, the uh, during the COVID-19. Among caregivers, um, so we saw 58% uh, indicated that their sleep had gotten worse during the period and among healthcare professionals, then uh, thirty-nine percent indicated that uh, that their the quality of sleep had had deteriorated. So, just giving a bit of context again to this, um, sort of nationally and internationally, um, very very consistently, we see that figure of about thirty-eight, thirty-nine percent of people reporting. Uh, again, this is the general public, thirty-eight, thirty-nine percent reporting. Um, that their sleep has gotten worse during COVID-19. Um, and I think what's what's jumping out here is that again, among the caregivers, 
fifty-eight percent is very significantly higher than, than how the norm that we would observe. Um, and again, that's that's related to that, the, that those high stress levels and that high anxiety um, that that they're experiencing, um, and that's reflected in in the the, the quality of nighttime sleep. One of the key areas of the of the survey um, uh, was to identify for the different stakeholder groups what are the priorities that they would like to see ILFA focusing on. Um, so we presented them with a range of uh, areas uh, that ILFA could be advocating on, and we asked them to rank each of these in terms of importance to them uh, from uh, one to six. We had six areas asked them to rank them in terms of importance from one to six, with one being the most important, down to six being the least important for them. So these were that lung fibrosis has its own clinical care pathway like cancer care, promoting more awareness of the condition among GPs, more access to pulmonary rehab, awareness of the condition among hospital staff, promoting awareness of the condition among the wider public, and improving access to oxygen supplies. So among patients, um, the the top ranked uh, area for uh, ILFA to advocate on was that lung fibrosis would have its own clinical care pathway like cancer care. And that was followed by promoting more awareness of the condition among GPs. And third was uh, more access to pulmonary rehab. Uh, then we followed by awareness of the condition among hospital staff, uh, awareness of the condition among the wider public, fifth, and improving access to oxygen supplies uh, six and actually, if we if we just well, we were able to to drill down into just looking looking only at um, those patients who were on oxygen and improving access to oxygen supplies was still a fairly low priority for those because so indicating that you know they were happy with their um, access to oxygen supplies, although that was a cause of potential worry during the lockdown period. Among caregivers, then we saw um, a very similar uh, pattern of response. Um, the, the top priority among caregivers was that lung fibrosis would have its own clinical care pathway. Um, the third ranked uh, area for, among caregivers was promoting more awareness among GPs. And the second ranked was more access to pulmonary rehab. And then among healthcare professionals, we have the same top three again. Um, top ranked was the clinical care pathway. The second was promoting awareness among GPs. And third was more access to pulmonary rehab. So I think the, the big takeaway from this one uh, for me would be that the the top three priorities uh, are the same among across all three stakeholder groups, and the top priority among all among all three was that uh, uh, for, for that clinical care pathway to, to be established. So um, just. A, on the back of the, uh, to, to finish up just on the back of the, the telephone interviews, we were able to pull some um, some comments and I've just set out a few of the illustrative comments here just to give you a flavor of what we got back. Um, I think these might you know, resonate with, with a lot of you um, uh, on the call today. So um, for patients, just a couple of illustrative comments. Um, it's the fear if I get this, the struggle, if I do get this, what am I going to do? What's my plan? How am I going to cope? Or am I going to survive this really? And what we saw with patients was, um, you know, the 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 anxiety or the worry wasn't so much for the present. It was more, it was a longer term um, anxiety that the patients were, were were expressing. And the next comment from patients, then. So again, just this is the day to day anxiety. My anxiety levels start to rise. I'll keep the doors open so he can walk straight in and put the bags down and disinfect everything. So that's the sort of the, the day to day uh, anxiety. I think that's a common that was a common uh, thread. Among caregivers, here's the awareness issue. Um, really, I don't think that he and this is referring to their GP that he really understands about IPF. I don't think a lot of doctors do, to be honest. So um, that's what we saw that on the on the ranking the priorities. And again, it came across in these telephone interviews. Uh, in the background, there's the constant fear that you're going to do something silly that would cause him, the patient to die. So that's that, that that's that anxiety there that we spoke about among the caregivers. And then for healthcare professionals, um, 
and and uh, Lynn, Lynn referred to this uh, on, on her talk. Um, all outpatient appointments have been cancelled, so I'm trying to push now to get back to even doing virtual clinics because I feel it's very unfair in these patients. So the, they're very, very uh, kind of conscious of, of that fact and that backlog building up. And then finally, um, I think for the mental health, the implications of this long term are going to be enormous. And that was a kind of a consistent uh, message, especially from the healthcare professionals uh, that there. And, you know, I suppose we're all aware of the the pressure that the system uh, was under, the major changes that uh, had had to take place. Uh, and again, the, there's a longer term view as well, as well as, you know, the impact uh, at, the, at the time. The survey results uh, will be part of a press release and uh, this is to uh, raise, raise awareness and coping with co coronavirus and how to stay calm and protect your mental health. Definitely a good read. In April, Ilfa contacted Professor Kelly and he very kindly gave permission for Ilfa to order his book and provide it to, to all our members. So this has been wonderful. It has been sent out. And if anybody has not got a copy of it, please get in touch with us. So at this point in time, I'm going to hand over to Professor Kelly now. Um, so th thank you for the introduction. And uh, thank you also for um, your support for this, um, this book, Coping with Coronavirus which, as you said, appeared just earlier this year when, you know, anxieties were very, very high and uh, there was so much uncertainty, and as in a sense there still is. Um, but but we, we, we brought out th this, um, uh, this book to try and help guide a little bit um, in what was such a, such, a, such a difficult time and such an uncertain period. So I was really pleased when your organization distributed it to its members. Um, and I'm just going to talk through some of the main points of it today, because as this situation with COVID-19 develops, the issues develop in certain ways, but many of them remain the same. I think we heard from Danny there some, you know, very concerning numbers about the number of people who are anxious um, carers who are even more anxious, and the general free-floating anxiety that we still have. Um, you know, even with all the guidance, which is very good, all the public health guidance, we have people who are, you know, obsessionally worried about what they're doing. And on the other hand, we have people who appear almost casual. So it can be difficult for us when we when we see people behaving so differently to keep our own uh, chart our own course and do what we think is necessary. So I'm going to talk about some of these themes over the next 10 or 12 minutes. Um, so the, the book is divided into five sections. You see them there on the screen, knowing, thinking, feeling, doing, and being. And, and th th this is an effort to kind of chart out the main areas of concern and break down what we can do to help ourselves through this rather sustained period of, of enhanced anxiety. So if we move on to the next slide, perhaps, um, we will see the first section, which is about knowledge and, and knowing and what we do with information. Now, Ireland has experienced epidemics and pandemics in the past, notably the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. But what really sets this one apart is our society is different and there is so much information floating around the place now, that we are deluged with information. And our task is to figure out which bits matter and which bits don't. So um, it is important that we stay uh, informed about coronavirus, but it's incredibly important that we don't obsess about it. It is something over which we have a certain amount of control, but not full control. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my father used to always say to me, do what you can and then stop, because um, you can't control everything fully. Uh, and our knowledge is partial. I mean, we've seen the, the guidance about face masks, for example, face coverings develop quite significantly over the course of the past few months. Um, and when the advice changes, 
we change our behavior. So we need to keep up with it, um, but we need to recognize the limits of advice. And I've written here that we shouldn't fill in our knowledge gaps with speculation or random musings on social media in particular. Um, our brains are very funny. We get drawn to the most outrageous, most unlikely uh, theories about things, even though we know full well they're not true. We still go and we read them. We, we look at the tweets or we, we, we follow the people, even though our logical brain, you know, the logical bit knows it's wrong. Um, off we go reading this material that we know is utterly unfounded. So we need to reflect on that habit and sort of know ourselves and our media and information habits a lot better because what we read, even if we don't believe it, um, it has a huge effect on our mood because we are not entirely logical creatures. Some of us aren't logical at all, um, but certainly um, we all have illogic. So we read something, we know it's not true, we dismiss it, but it still packs an emotional punch. Um, and that's, so, so that's what I want to say about, about uh, knowing, um, which is stay informed, but do not obsess. Don't fill in the knowledge gaps. There is stuff that we don't know. And then try to be a little more aware of how we use information. If we're constantly refreshing websites for statistics and numbers and so forth, um, that is not helpful, that is unhelpful. So the bottom line is that we should look at the media and inform ourselves about coronavirus no more than twice a day and 15 minutes each time is what I recommend. That's for the global pandemic. We should not try to stay abreast of every single development through a given day. Once or twice a day, information from a reliable source and ignore everything else. And that way we manage our knowledge in such a way as to decrease our anxiety. We really have to try and do that because you know, media and social media are so attractive, but we have to be absolutely rigid with ourselves and limit our intake if we are to remain calm. Okay, so that's what I want to say about knowing. If we move on to the next slide, which concerns um, thinking. Um, and the big, then this is very, very important when we're discussing uh, coronavirus or the pandemic with uh, children, for example, uh, or people who have limited understanding for, for whatever reason, that we need to need to break it down. And children are the best example. Um, children are prone to infinite worry. You know, um, like one child said to me at the start, could we all die? Could the entire human race die? And of course, the answer is no, that, that's, that, it, that, that's just not possible. That won't happen. It's not the ballpark we're in, nothing like it. But a child's mind has no sense of limit, no sense of proportion, and worry can appear infinite. So the best way to address that um, is to um, uh, share some facts. There is an illness. Um, it's uh, spread through much of the world. Uh, we're working hard to contain it. And then you switch to behavior. You switch from a fact, those were facts, to a behavior. And you say, look, all, given all that information, here's what we do. We keep our distance, we wear the face coverings, we wash our hands. And with children, you then march them off to wash their hands. And children are very good at uh, focusing on things they can do today at home. And if we convince them that washing their hands will help protect their relatives who might be old or ill, um, th that, that's an enormous contribution uh, to controlling uh, spread, but also to the mental health of the child who gets the message there are things we can do to reduce the risk. Not reduce it fully, but there are elements we can control. Others that we should focus on that rather than reading apocalyptic visions of what might or might not happen. Um, and we need to consciously avoid that. We might move on to the next one, which is to do with managing our feelings. Um, and what, you know, our, our feelings are very, very strong and they change very quickly. And broadly speaking, we have very little familiarity with how we feel from moment to moment. I'm often feeling irritated and angry. And when I do that, I need to go through a short checklist in my head 
which starts with, do I need to eat something? Do I need to drink something? Do I need to sit down? Actually have something to be angry about. You know, 90% of the time I don't. I'm irritated over nothing. It's just, it's an emotion. Switch on the radio and we happen to hear a piece of bad news from, say, Brazil. And this clouds everything for us for the day. Whereas, in fact, there might indeed be bad news in Brazil, but we need to place that in the context of our own lives if we are to get by. So we need to look at it in a, either in a global context or in the context of our lives today or wherever it might be. But we should also realize we need to survive. We cannot, we cannot let that emotion, that negative emotion, uh, shape our entire day and our mood. And, and this happens all the time in relation to other things as well. Uh, you'll be familiar with possibly being in traffic. Someone does something thoughtless in the traffic and you're still annoyed about it an hour later. We let these emotions assume more importance as if they're facts. So we've got to be aware of that. Uh, and finally, of course, talking to other people is so important. Um, but we, do, we also should remember that when we're talking to someone else, they are talking to us. So we're often looking for some reassurance from the other person. We might mention something casually, but in fact, we're worried about it and we hope they are doing the exact same thing to us. And we need to give it time, particularly now with so much free floating anxiety. Um, and as Danny was pointing out, the levels of concern and anxiety um, are very high among certain groups, particularly carers. I thought that was very striking in Danny's figures. Okay, so let's move on to doing, which is the next slide, which is um, what we uh, might, our behaviors. Um, it's important we don't increase, uh, increase panic. And we do this inadvertently. No one means to increase panic, but we often do. So, for example, someone might read an utterly outrageous um, media story that is clearly false. But even with that warning, what we have done is we have amplified um, what we might call fake news, uh, for the lack of a better term. Um, so amplifying and spreading things that are untrue, even if it's so untrue it's a joke, amplifying and spreading still spreads important point of, of the talk, which is so much of our lives is now dominated by anxiety about COVID-19, that we need to prioritize any activity that puts COVID-19 out of our minds, just gets it out afterwards and said, I was totally wrong, that what everyone needed to do was knitting. And, and I said, no, no, you're wrong. And I'm, I, you know, I'm right. But she persisted. And she said that when she is knitting, there's nothing in her head. She, she's not thinking of anything. There is only the knitting. She is utterly absorbed in the moment. And that is precisely what mindfulness is. And that is the state of mind we need to try to achieve. Some people achieve this by knitting, some people by walking, some people by swimming is particularly immersive, achieving that state of flow. And as I say, rewarding yourself for this and being compassionate towards yourself and others, because this is a very hard hard time. The thing about being, it's to do with our whole lives, us, the full size of us, which is very big. You know, we are complicated, sprawling creatures with relationships and connections all over the place. So proportionality about COVID-19 is important. It is a big thing in all of our lives now, but it is not the only thing in our lives now. There are other big things too. And we make a mistake if we project all of our worries onto uh, COVID-19. Being with other people and talking with others and reaching out is a really good way of reminding us that other people have different issues with COVID-19, different issues unrelated to it, and that the world is bigger than our worries. And we are always bigger than our anxiety, even if it doesn't feel that way. So the final slide here um, uh, has some, um, the next slide has some resources that can be useful. Um, and I I'm sure these slides can be made available if you wish. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US have a really good book, a really good uh, resource talking with children about coronavirus disease. And it even has a, a workbook, a kind of a coloring book to help children put it in context. The, the, the second and third points are to do with people with intellectual disability if they're struggling in relation to um, uh, this period. And the final one is to do with uh, a resource for parents and families. So the very final slide then 
is just a uh, reminder regarding the booklet, which I think uh, most of you will have received, but it's, it's, we tried to make this book free, uh, to be honest, but the ebook people, the ebook platforms who sell it insist on a, a minimum one euro charge. So any royalties we get are going to the Irish Red Cross about it today. And I do appreciate your support. Could newly diagnosed patients who might have, uh, might be anxious about their care? Well, clearly, I mean, a, a new diagnosis of anything is a moment of great anxiety and uncertainty. Um, yeah, and, you know, we need to re recognize that. And we need to allow ourselves, when we're newly diagnosed with anything, allow ourselves a bit of anxiety. This is to be expected because it takes time <clears throat> to figure out the, the, the shape and the size of what we're dealing with. Obviously, um, getting information uh, you know, from health professionals and relying on reliable information is critical. And your organization, of course, um, will be, uh, is enormously helpful. Its resource is huge for people who are newly diagnosed. Being newly diagnosed now in the era of COVID-19 is even more concerning, I guess. But it's important to separate out the two because this pandemic will pass as pandemics always have. So it's important not to be constantly at the heightened level of worry that a you know, diagnosis plus COVID-19 might engender and to realize these are separate things which, you know, which will have different trajectories into the future. But information, reaching out, and a bit of self-compassion go a very long way toward getting through it. Thank you, Professor, for all of those calming words. Thanks again. Now, if I may, our fifth speaker today, our next speaker is Neve Julian, and she is a respiratory physiotherapist at the University uh, Hospital of Limerick. And we are very grateful to Neve and her colleague Paula Ryan for delivering online pulmonary rehab classes to Alpha members every Monday since the COVID-19 pa pandemic. The feedback Feedback from participants has been excellent, and I would encourage you to join up for these for the for the class. So thanks again for all you do for us, Neve. And I will hand you over to Neve now. Thank you. Hello. Um, thanks, Eddie, for the introduction. Hi. Um, um, thanks very much for asking me to speak here today, and. Thanks also to Ilfa for the opportunity for running the online um, exercise classes. It's uh, a highlight of a lot of my weeks. Um, we're really, really enjoying it down in Limerick. Um, and, you know, it's just great, the social connection and to see everybody moving and um, taking exercise together. I'm really, really enjoying it. So, um, going to the first slide. Um, so the title of my talk, Exercise is Medicine, it's something I'm quite passionate about. Um, I really, truly believe exercise is medicine. And, you know, I hope that as I talk through today that it will sink in more and more people. I think a lot of the ILFA members, it's nearly like preaching to the converted. A lot of you, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of exercise all the time. So it's just to talk through it and to kind of get that point across again. So I suppose firstly, what drug has been proven to improve functional health, exercise tolerance, muscle strength and endurance, bone health, cardiometabolic profile, body composition, well-being, cognitive function, improved sleep, with no side effects. It sounds like a wonder drug, doesn't it? And if it was in pill form, we'd all be popping it every day. But it's exercise. So just moving on. Um, exercise has been shown to cause health and happiness. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> so exercise training, we know for a long time it has been proven to be safe and effective intervention prevention for prevention and rehab in chronic conditions. So in IPF in particular, so despite the complexity of the signs and the symptoms presented in IPF, the provided exercise training is a feasible and effective treatment for clinical improvement. And this has been proven, it's effective for clinical improvement. 
So emerging data shows significant enhancements in exercise capacity, in dyspnea or breathlessness, and quality of life amongst IPF patients after exercise training intervention. So the current exercise training data in IPF provides sufficient evidence of clinical benefit for consideration to be given to recommending exercise-based pulmonary rehab as a standard of care in IPF. And this is part of the National Patient Charter from ILFA. It's one of the six key elements of the standard of care in pulmonary rehabilitation. And this has been recognized by the ITF and is part of their position statement on the management of ITF. So every patient died with a diagnosis of IPF should undergo pulmonary rehab. So just, I suppose, the mechanism of deconditioning and reconditioning. So we get a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So, you know, we have to acknowledge there are physiological limitations that come with that. It's not like, you know, any healthy body going out taking up exercise there are physiological lim limitations as um as was mentioned earlier it's um you know it's that decreased lung compliance it's stiffening within your lungs which reduces your lung volumes and it also affects the diffusion then of oxygen into your bloodstream so this in turn then will cause um breathlessness and the breathlessness then will lead to inactivity, and this inactivity then leads to reduced quality of life. So our U-turn here at the end, the exercise training. So it has been proven and it's well documented. We're always measuring six-minute walk tests, but that six-minute walk test distance, it has really strong um, prognostic value. So we can tell from those meters how many meters you can achieve in six minutes what your prognosis is going to be. If there's a big fall off in that distance, we know it's not so good. There's, you know, there's certain standards, there's certain numbers that we look at. But that distance that you can walk, that the level of activity that you can achieve, it's so important for your long-term health. So exercise training, we know it incre increases cardiovascular health, works the heart pump, makes it stronger. We know it improves your muscles and it improves your bones. And we know also from research, it, it improves your pulmonary physiology. So it hasn't exactly been nailed down how it does this, but there are theories. So the repetitive stimulus of um, high ventilatory amounts, so basically breathing hard and fast for a sustained period, stretching out your chest muscles, so improving your chest expansion, so moving that chest wall out every time. This results in more efficient breathing pattern, so improved respiratory muscle strength, and it improves the elasticity then of your lungs as well, and that compliance. So how much they will open and how much they will spring back then with each breath. So by doing this exercise, by improving this pulmonary physiology, you're going to have further increase your exercise capacity. You'll be able to deal with the breathlessness a little bit better, You'll be able to do a little bit more every day. Your quality of life will improve, and this leads to overall improvement then in your health status. So, what does today look like? And for some people, it's it can be a bit chaotic. Um, there's lots of emotion, there's anxiety, there might be fear, there might be feeling of isolation, fatigue. There might be tablets and more tablets to be taken that cause side effects, loss of appetite. There might be breathlessness scattered throughout the day, periods of breathlessness. You might have a requirement for oxygen. And as I said, it's, it's chaotic. There's a lot, lack of control. So my challenge to you today is to try and take some little bit of charge. And it kind of resonates a little bit with Professor Kelly, what he was saying last. So to take charge. So surviving the fall, getting your diagnosis, learning to live again is the important thing. So what elements of your life can you take control of rather than this chaotic jungle and firefighting that some people have to endure throughout the day? Try and take a little bit more control back yourself. So what can today look like? Could it be a little bit more organized? Could it be a little bit more controlled? Yes, there will be still periods of breathlessness, of anxiety, of fear. 
they will be scattered throughout the day, but can you control them a little bit more yourself? Things like breathing control, so eating regularly throughout the day, eating a breakfast is really important, particularly if you have medications to take. Getting out for a daily walk. More elements of self-care, so looking after yourself, even if it's just making a pot of tea and sitting down for yourself and drinking it. Self-care is so important. Connection then, so connection, so social connection or connection with your environment. Your exercise program, fill it in every day. Just commit to it every day. Commit to that to yourself because it will help. Meal time, family time is important. Relaxation, so trying to switch off. Um, Chris Kelly was talking about mindfulness, so to be able to relax um, and sleep, so important as well. A regular sleep pattern, a regular bedtime, a regular get up, get up time. It, it all has healing anti-inflammatory properties and will contribute to your overall health. So exercise can empower you to feel more in control. And so these are different ways I suppose it can help. So positive relations. So more positive social interactions can come out of exercising. So you go out for your walk, you know, you might meet a neighbour or a friend and they say, oh, I heard you, Martin's well, you know, I'm delighted to see you out and about. Well done to you for getting out and about. And even just that little pat on the back can put a little bit of spring into your step and can help you maybe walk a little bit more. And, you, you know, you come back to the house, oh, I met so-and-so, you maybe got a bit of news. And it's a more positive, positive interaction with the person that you meet back at your own house as well, as well, rather than kind of being stuck in four walls and having nothing to say to each other all day long. So it really does improve positive relations. So mastery also. So it makes you just feel more in control of the situation when you live. So it's about taking that little bit of control, taking that 30 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, whatever it is out of the day and controlling it and doing your bit of exercise. Self-acceptance. So it also, um, it gives you a more positive view of yourself. And that's really important. So if you can achieve that little bit of exercise every day, and maybe you can do a minute more tomorrow, it gives you a more positive view of yourself. And that links into the next one, the positive attitude. So it improves your health. And so it improves your body image, your the image of yourself. And we see it, you know, through our pulmonary rehab courses, you see people physically change the more exercise they do. And that's everybody, you know, no matter what kind of condition your health is in, you know, you can make physical changes to your body with exercise. So autonomy then is the next one. And again, it's just having more confidence in your decision making. So, and it's all part of having that control over your activities, your daily activities. So personal growth then is next, and this links back in with what I've been saying already. So it's setting yourself little challenges and achieving them and setting goals for the future, and you're constantly growing then as a person. And mental health. So we all know, and it's well documented, that exercise will improve your mood, and it will also ward off depressive episodes, which are so common when you have a chronic illness and so understandable when you have a chronic illness. So exercise really does help with that, and regular exercise will help with that. So what is the prescription then? So the prescription is exercise. And as I said at the start, if there was a magic little pill that we could pop every morning to get all of those benefits that we spoke about earlier, improved muscle strength, improved bone density, all those benefits, the improved heart health, improved lung health, We'd pop it wholesale every morning and we'd all be taking it. Exercise, it's a little bit harder, but it's manageable for everybody. No matter what your health condition is, you can do a little bit of exercise every single day. So exactly what we're going to advise then. So I suppose I'm talking to a wide group of people today. I can't tell you exactly what to do. And, you know, I hope you're all linked in with services locally, with physios locally with CNSs locally who have experience in prescribing exercise um, for pulmonary fibrosis. So the American College of Sports Medicine, this is a kind of a generic exercise prescription. So they recommend for all states of health, ill health, uh, a minimum of 150 minutes of exercise per week. So if you break that down, um, if you were doing 30 minutes most days of the week, you'd be hitting that target. Now that's a minimum and 
the more the better. The more you do, the more benefits you're going to get from it. So that's your aerobic exercise. So that would be your getting out for a walk, if, um, a cycle, even a stationary bike, whatever you can manage. Um, Fred Skelly was talking about swimming being a really good way of um, switching out the mindfulness. Um, I know it's not an option at the moment and we'll all be a little bit reluctant to be going back into the pool, but you know, um, it's just another example of, I suppose, aerobic walking. It's the easiest, it's free. We're having a beautiful summer. Get out and give it a try. And um, also they were mentioned in the um, survey, you know, the pedometers, that there's, there's a, a big link between the amount of exercise and the amount of um, compliance with exercise. And the pedometers, they're so simple. Loads of people have Fitbit that will count your steps. It's just another little motivational tool when you're at home and trying to have your own canoe, trying to be doing your exercise yourself, particularly at this time. And then the muscle strength training. So that's really important as well. And it will be a big part of pulmonary rehab. So it's that repetitive strengthening exercises. Um, so the likes of the fit to stand exercises, using the resistance band to strengthen your muscles. Um, so that's an important part of your exercise prescription then as well. And flexibility. So we spoke about the chest expansion um, the, to expand that ribcage. Flexibility is really important as well. Oftentimes with chronic lung diseases, you'll see a lot of tension around the muscles in the neck, around the upper chest. So flexibility, stretching is really, really important as well to improve your overall exercise tolerance. So the next slide. Yeah, so just to reiterate, I suppose exercise is um, it's planned, it's repetitive, it's structured. So exercise differs from physical activity. So some people say, oh, I'm doing loads, I'm pushing around the house, I'm pushing around the garden, sure, I never sit down. Unfortunately, that's not exercise. That's physical activity, and that's really important too for your health. But exercise is what we're talking about here. So it's that confined time every day that you're going to give to carrying out an exercise program to go on for a daily walk. Just to reiterate, that is important. And any physical activity counts towards better health, even just a few minutes. So the more you move, the better you will do long term. It's really, really important. And the next point goes on to that. So challenge yourself to do more. So if you start today and you do a five minute walk, tomorrow try and do a little bit more. And you know, you might, for a few months, you might continue to go on an upward incline. You might have an exacerbation and it goes right back to where you started from again. And it can be that thought to up and down and up and down. But it's really important to just keep building yourself back up. You will get knocks. You do have a chronic health condition. But it's important each time you get a knock to build yourself back up again. Um, don't allow yourself to build barriers. And I suppose we're all guilty of this, um, reasons why you're not exercising. So whether it be the weather, you know, we'll all make up excuses why not to exercise. Um, a lot of it, you know, if people are honest, can get, come down to just lack of interest. I'm just not interested. Exercise is not something that I've had in my life. It's not something that I want in my life. But with this illness, it's something that you can really improve your quality of life with. It has too many benefits not to engage with it, you know. So ways to help with that then maybe can set a little goal for yourself, maybe involve a friend, make it enjoyable. Um, shortness of breath then can be another barrier. I'm too short of breath today to do anything. Just start, just do say, okay, I'll look at it, I'll do two minutes and at least I have something done you know, maybe to do marching on the spot for two minutes. Oftentimes, you begin to feel better and you'll want to do a little bit more. Joint pain, it can be another common barrier. But, you know, with joint pain, it has been also proven to improve with exercise. Um, exercise itself has an anti-inflammatory effect on the body and it helps with different forms of arthritis. And a lack of energy, you know, you're just out of steam, you know, maybe you're feeling a little bit nauseous as a side effect maybe of some of the antifibrotics, 
you know, that you just can't face up to it again. But just start, do something small. As I said, just do two minutes and see how you're feeling. Reassess after the two minutes and see can you go on and do this bit more. You need to also accept your limitations, you know, you and and we realize that as healthcare professionals. I'm preaching here about exercise. Some days it's going to be really damn hard to get out and exercise. And sometimes you just have to accept that, that, you know, I'm going to be limited. I might be able to do a couple of bits indoors today, but that's all I can manage today. And um, sometimes people come in and they find it really hard to accept a new baseline, maybe that this disease has brought to their life. So maybe previously they enjoyed a five mile hill walk every day and that's just not possible anymore. And it's the acceptance and it takes a lot of time to accept that, that, you know, maybe 2K on the flat is what you can do at the moment. And that's not to say that you can't improve that and build that up again, but you may never get back to your five mile hill walk. So group exercise has been shown to have further benefits and you, you develop a support net, network through that. So if there is local support groups or maybe it's not um, specific to pulmonary fibrosis, but um, you, know, you will still get further benefits from group exercise programs. And routine, routine, routine. I can't overemphasize the importance of routine and regular exercise. It's really, really important. Once you stop, if you stop for 48 hours, straight away you begin to lose the benefits that you have built up over time. And that's the problem we see time and time again with pulmonary rehab. And, you know, people will engage really well for the 8 or 10 or 12 week course, whatever it is. And after that, you know, they'll drop off, they'll lose interest maybe a little bit more. So it's so important to be diligent with your routine at home. You know, try every day of the week. If you take the odd day off, that's absolutely fine. But most days of the week, it's really, really important. And if you take a day off, don't allow yourself to take that second day off or else it's developing to a third and a fourth and a fifth. And then it's a lot harder to go back to the school routine and keep it regular. I can't overemphasize the importance of it. And physical activity, just to reiterate again, it's a key factor in how you perceive your quality of life. So if you can get up, if you can do your exercise today, if you can go for your walk today, straight away you tick that box, you can see, yeah, my life is good today. I, I have achieved something with my day. And it's really, really important for both the head and for the body. So I think we're on to the final slide. Yeah, so looking after my health today gives me more health, more hope for tomorrow. And that's the point I wouldn't want to finish up on, and it's looking after my health. So rather than looking after my disease, so it's just changing, shifting that focus a little bit, more to behaviours, to managing health rather than ill health. I suppose with a, a diagnosis of a chronic illness, all the focus goes into the disease and managing that disease. And maybe we neglect our whole bodies a little bit more. So it's you know, it's all that Professor Kelly said before me, and and it's hopefully, and um, what I said a little bit today, it's looking after the health, and in particular, using exercise to look after your health on a daily basis, and to give you better hope for tomorrow. It's hanging on to those meters in the six-minute walk test. That's what's really, really important. So thanks very much. Thank you, Neve. Hey, may I just ask, um, are we carrying out virtual pulmonary rehab for ILD patients? And if so, what monitoring and assessment tools are we using? So in Limerick, um, we're just uh, we're just finishing with our first virtual pulmonary rehab group. So um, it was a new venture, and I suppose brought on by COVID positives and negatives kind of to it. Um, there's um, one patient with pulmonary fibrosis in the class, so it's a mixed group. We haven't had a dedicated pulmonary fibrosis group yet. So um, as regards outcome measures then, quite similar to what we would do normally. So we look at lung function, we look at exacerbation history, we look at admission rate. Um, we had to, normally we would do a six minute walk test or a shuttle walk test as a test of their physical fitness. 
but now we're using a one minute sit to stand test. Um, we use various quality of life measures. We look at falls, history, you know, with regard to the safety of exercising at home and independently. Um, and um, I think that's mostly what we're going through. It's based on the National Clinical Programme for COPD and asthma. As we uh, mentioned already, there is no National Clinical Programme for, um, for IPS. So, you know, there is, we're not using specific IPS outcome measures, but I suppose it's the best we can do in Limerick at the moment, but we would hope to run a dedicated um, pulmonary fibrosis um, virtual rehab in the coming months, definitely. Okay. And just one more. Should all patients diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis be referred to pulmonary rehabilitation? And do we need to raise more awareness around this issue? Yeah, well, as I mentioned already, it's, you know, it's in the National Patient Charter. It's one of the six key elements and the ITS, um, it's in their uh, position statement on managing pulmonary fibrosis. So it's really, really important. As soon as you get the diagnosis, you should be referred to pulmonary, fibro or pulmonary rehab. There's waiting lists in some centres, um, but it is, it's such a key element to management of the disease. And, um, at any stage along the disease, so from mild to moderate severe, the, there seem, from the literature there seems to be more benefit, more capacity to increase their exercise tolerance in mild and moderate disease, but even at the more severe end, there's still benefits to engaging in a pulmonary rehab program. Lovely. Thank you so much, Niamh, for, for your expertise. Thank you again the end of our series of talks and I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. I would like to thank uh, all our speakers uh, for their time, their expertise uh, and patience. I would also like to extend a special thanks to Gemma for all her work for ILFA, especially during the last few months, which have been absolutely hectic. So we would really be lost without her. Thanks again to all the volunteers on the ILFA committee for, uh, for their Trojan, Trojan work. Thanks again to Shauna, Andy at Production Buddies for their help in running this event. We'd also like to thank our sponsor and we hope you enjoyed this event. Our summer months, uh, over the summer months, ILFA will be hoping to have a tea party fundraiser to support us. We hope you will join in and you will find out more information on our website and on Facebook. After we finish here, there is a small uh, slideshow to follow. So on that, I'm wishing you all a very, very pleasant weekend. Remember to stay safe and hold firm. Thank you so much. Bye bye now.